In this video we will dive into creation of full stack application from start to the end. And actually this video is a part of my full series where we are building the Trello clone with full stack and web sockets. And you can find the link to the full course in the description box below. But if you just want to start with the basics, let's jump right into it. Welcome to my full stack course where we are building real project from scratch. It's so great to have you here. In this course we will implement a real project starting from the empty folder and to the finished fully functional production application which will be deployed on the real server. We will implement all features the typical project needs, like for example authentication, working with API, managing and creating reactive state, working with forms and much much more. In this course we will use lots of different tools. On our client we will use Angular, which is the best solution for big scalable production applications. On backend we will use Node.js with Express to create our API. To store our data we will use MongoDB, which is a really popular solution to store data in your project. And also we will use Socket.io to create real-time updates inside our application. Obviously we will write the best possible code, which will be dry, scalable and easy to understand. By the end of this course you will be able to create your own project of any complexity by using these tools. Who am I? My name is Alexander Kocherhin and I am a web developer with more than 10 years of experience, as well as a professional instructor with various courses regarding web technologies. I did my best to put all my knowledge inside this course and I want to share it with you. So welcome on board and let's get started. In this video I want to talk about technologies that we will use inside this course. And just from the beginning I want to set realistic expectations. We will use quite a lot of technologies here. It will be Angular, Node.js, Express, MongoDB, TypeScript and Socket.io. And this is a lot of stuff to learn. And in this course I won't teach you all this stuff from start to the end. It is simply not possible. The amount of knowledge in every single tool here is enormous. This is why this course is focused on building real project from start to the end. Yes, sure, you will understand and learn all these technologies on some level, but here in some technologies you might require basic understanding what we are talking about at all. With that being said, let's jump into the list. And the first one in our list is Angular. If you don't know, Angular is one of three most popular front-end frameworks and we will use it to build front-end side of our application. Angular is a really strict framework which feeds huge companies and we have their TypeScript out of the box. Which means by using Angular we can build big applications, make them safe because of typings and scale them if we need to. If you don't know Angular at all, I highly recommend you to look at least on the basics of Angular, how components are working, how to create modules, how to add routing and so on. After understanding this stuff it will be much easier for you to jump in the course. The next in the list we have Node.js, and actually Node.js we will use on the backend with framework which is called Express. And if you don't know, Express is the most popular framework for Node.js. It is super small, it is not strict, it is really flexible, and we will use it as a really popular solution to build backend. And in this project we must build not only API, but also manage socket connections on the backend. This is why Express is a really nice choice here. But it is not all, inside Express by default we have JavaScript, of course it is not the best approach. We really want to use TypeScript, because we will use TypeScript on the client with Angular, this is why on the backend with Express we also want to use TypeScript. Why is that? Because actually TypeScript brings to JavaScript static typings. This makes our code much safer and we see all our problems not in runtime, but in the transpiling time. Obviously in our project we must store our data somewhere, which actually means for our backend we need a database. And the most popular solution here is MongoDB. This is really the most popular database in the world where we can store data. And it fits really nice in our stack with Angular on the client and Node.js with Express on the backend. And last but not least in the list is Socket.io. We want in our application to implement WebSockets to notify other users when we create task or create column, when we change port. All users inside these ports must be notified. 
and the most popular solution for WebSockets inside Node.js world is called Socket.io. It is the library which helps us to manage WebSockets on the backend and simultaneously on the client. This is why it is really a good choice. And once again, if you are not familiar with some tools here, it is totally fine, we will start from scratch. But we will focus learning of all these tools just on everyday needs, which actually means we will learn basic stuff, correct stuff and stuff which is needed to implement this real project. In this video I want to remind you about source code, because actually inside this course, in every single lecture where we code something, you can find attached code of this specific lecture, which actually means every single lecture has a source code inside. And if you just want to grab a source code of the lecture, you can certainly do it. Just scroll under the video and check the archive that is attached to the video. And obviously, as always, if you have some problems with your code, something is not compiling, or you just have a question regarding the video or the course in general, you can just write your comments under the video and I will certainly answer them. In this video, we will install Node.js and Angular on your machine. As you can see here, I am on the official website Node.js.org, where you can download Node.js on your machine if you don't have it installed. You can check if it installed on your machine if you just write Node-version inside your console. If you are getting the version like 16, it is totally fine. If you have something older, I highly recommend you to update your Node version. But here is the important point. As you can see, we have two versions, first of all 16, LTS and 17 current. And you might think, okay, I need to install current. And I can't recommend you to install current, because long-term support version is typically much more stable. This is why for all my projects, especially if they are shipping on production, I am using LTS node version. Which actually means if you are jumping to this website and you see like LTS version maybe 17 or 18, I still recommend you to download LTS and not current. And it doesn't matter on what operational system you are working, Node is working everywhere. You simply download it here, you install it on your machine, and then you check inside console with Node-version that you successfully installed Node on your machine. You can also type here npm-version to check that npm is also available for you. Our next step is to install Angular, and actually to work with Angular we are using tool which is called Angular CLI, which actually means this is the tool which helps us first of all to create an Angular project, then generate different modules or components and do a lot of stuff with Angular. So how we can install Angular CLI on your machine? As you can see here, I am on the official website angular.io slash CLI, and here is the first step installing Angular CLI, and we can simply copy this command, which will install globally Angular CLI on your machine. And as you can see for this, we are using npm, which we already have, after installation of Node.js. This is why here I can simply throw npm install minus g, Angular CLI, and I am installing globally Angular CLI on my machine. Now we must check if our Angular CLI was successfully installed. For this we can just write ng-version, and here is some important information. First of all we can see that Angular CLI is version 13, which actually means we installed Angular 13 here on our machine. Secondly, this is our node version which is activated on your machine, this is npm and this is operational system. And some versions of the Angular that you can see here. If you see such output, it means that you successfully installed Angular CLI on your machine. And the next step is to generate front-end part of our application. As you can see here, I am inside TMP folder and they didn't create our project yet, which actually means we really create everything from scratch. So what I want to do here, I can just write mkdir and then the name of our project, L Trello. And actually in this project we are implementing the clone of Trello, this is why here is just a name with a nice prefix. And obviously you can create a folder not from the terminal, but just in your file manager. Now I want to jump inside our Ltrello folder, and here we must create two different folders, because we want to separate our backend from our frontend. And you might ask why is that, and actually for different reasons. First of all it is easier to split your frontend and your backend, if you want for some reasons to put them later in different repositories or maybe even different teams. 
Secondly, if we separate them to different folders, then it is not monolith, which actually means we will for sure not inject some stuff from the backend inside frontend folder and vice versa. They are really isolated and separated as they need to be in the real application. This is why here I want to create two folders. First of all, it will be client and secondly, it will be server. And inside client we will have our Angular application and inside server we will have our Node.js with Express, which will be our backend application. Now we can generate our Angular application. As you can see here in the documentation, we simply run nginu and the name of the folder, then we just jump in the folder and we start our server. But here we have a problem because we directly created our client folder and we can jump now inside client folder, which actually means we can't create our Angular application with nginu because folder already exists. For this we can use a really nice command nginu and then here we must provide application name, directory and here is dot slash, which actually means this command will create for you new application of Angular in your existing directory. As you can see here I am inside client where exactly we want to generate our Angular application and I can paste this command here nginu app name directory dot slash. And obviously we don't want to name our application app name, this is why here we can provide El Trello, just like we named our project. After this I'm hitting enter and we started our process of generating new Angular project. And here we get some questions from Angular CLI. Do we need Angular routing? Of course yes, this is why I'm hitting yes. Here what style sheet we must use. And here I will choose SCSS. After this our project will be generated. As you can see here all packages were successfully installed. But afterwards we are getting a message which might be confusing for you. Here we are getting a message that now was created the branch master as our default git branch. And they might change the name to name later, but it is not there yet. And actually it doesn't matter what branch was generated for you, master or main, it will work in any case, so you can just ignore this warning. And the last step that we need to do is we need to start our client application. And as you can see here in the documentation, it is in gserve. So we simply inside client must write in gserve without specifying anything. As you can see here we are getting green output and the message that now Angular Live Development Server is listening on localhost 4200. So now we can simply open localhost 4200 and here we see the default Angular page. And now inside console our web server must be running all time while we are developing the application. Now let's have a look on the files that were generated for us. As you can see here I opened my editor, I am in folder El Trello and we have here two folders, server and client. And inside client all these files were generated with Angular CLI. And the most interesting part for us is this source folder and inside app we have our app component. This is exactly what we see here on the screen, this is the default component of Angular. This is why here first of all I want to remove app component scss, app component spec and here we have just these four files. Now we can jump inside app component html and we really want to remove everything except of this last line router outlet. This is extremely important for us. So I will remove everything from this file and just leave here router outlet. And on the top we can just write hello El Trello so we know that it is working. After this we must jump inside our app component and change it. Because actually here we are using style URLs from the file which we already removed. This is why we can simply remove this line and we just use here a template and we don't even need this title El Trello because we are not using it. We simply have our app component and it is an empty component. Now when I will jump to the page inside browser I can see that everything is removed, our page is completely cleaned and now we have just hello El Trello message. Which actually means we successfully prepared the client part of our application that we will implement later. In this video I want to prepare our backend part of our project to start implementation. As you can see here it is completely empty, so what we will create here? Actually what we must do, we must initialize package.json file with node. 
So here we can write npm init and it will create for us a package.json file. And here we must answer some questions, I typically just hit enter on all of them, it doesn't matter for us. And at the end we simply hit yes and we are ready. Now we can jump inside editor and go outside of our client to our server. And now here we have just a simple file package.json with name, version description, main, scripts where we don't have anything and empty author and the license. Now we must install two packages which will help us to create our backend project. So here we can write npm install and after this no daemon minus d. What does it mean? First of all, what is Nodemon? This is a special package which will help us to reload every single time when we change some file our backend application. And this is exactly what Angular is doing for us in the client. But inside our backend project we don't have some web server which is doing this for us. This is why we are installing Nodemon. And as you can see here I used minus d option, which actually means in our package.json no daemon was installed inside our dev dependencies. And dev dependencies are dependencies which we are using when we are developing a project. We don't need no daemon on production, this is just for development. And our next package is called tsnode and it is also only for development. This is why here we are writing npm install ts node minus d, which means this is a dev dependency. So what ts node is doing? This is just a process which will transpile our TypeScript code inside JavaScript code on the fly and execute it just like normal JavaScript code inside node. This is extremely efficient because we want to write TypeScript code. This is why we must transform it first from TypeScript to JavaScript. And this package helps to do it in a really easy way. Now let's jump inside package.json and check what we have. We have here two dev dependencies and here I want to create new script. We don't need this script test, we want here to start our web server. This is why here is a script start and here we can call nodemon and the path to our file. And here I want to write source slash server.ts. And as you can see here we have the server.ts which we will create in a second. So this is the TypeScript file. And the most interesting part here that we didn't specify that we are using here TS node inside nodemon. Nodemon does it automatically out of the box if we installed TS node and specified here not JavaScript file but TypeScript file. And the last thing that we must do is create TS config file which is a configuration file for TypeScript. This is why here inside our service folder I want to create new file tsconfig.json and here I will paste such config. And this is super typical config for known JS application with TypeScript. So here we are setting compiler options. This is exactly how TypeScript will transpile our code from TypeScript to JavaScript. So module common.js means that we are writing our TypeScript on the backend inside Node.js. And our target is ECMAScript 6 because Node can easily read ECMAScript 6 code. So our mode resolution is Node because we are writing inside Node.js. We want source maps, this is why source map true. Outdir is directory where our output will be generated. Here we have a dist folder, it will be created automatically. We also have here strict true and yes module interpop. And we need this option yes module interpop to convert correctly our TypeScript imports to require inside Node.js. So we successfully created our TypeScript config and now we can create our source folder and inside this file because as you can see here our server will live inside source server.ts. So I'm jumping inside source and I'm creating file server.ts and don't forget ts not js. Now we can jump inside and simply write console log server just to test if it is working. Now I will jump inside console and here inside server folder I can write npm start. As you can see here we got an output from no daemon which is totally fine. It is watching TypeScript files here and here no daemon started our ts node source server ts which actually means it simply uses ts node inside but it restarts our server. And this is the output server that we wrote inside this file. And no daemon will restart our server every single time when we make some changes.
In this video we will talk about installing database on your machine. And as I already mentioned we will use MongoDB here. So what is the idea? We must install on our local machine database so we can save there and read from there some data that we will use in our application. This data will be available for us only locally. At the moment when we want to deploy our project to production, we must set up the database on production and we will do it at the end of this course. So now the question is how we can install MongoDB on your specific machine. And you can work on different operational systems, so we want something that will work everywhere without hassle. And actually installing the database can always have some difficulties. And here as you can see I already opened the official MongoDB website with install MongoDB section. This is the URL, so you can check it if you are interested. And it looks really easy, we simply choose here an operational system. So here I am clicking on the link MongoDB Download Center and I am now here on this web page and at this point it is already not really clear what MongoDB we must install. There are different versions of it, there are free versions that we want to use and there are paid solutions that we don't need. And actually here we must scroll a little bit and see here MongoDB Community Server. Actually this MongoDB Community is the name of the free version of MongoDB that we want to use. So here on the right we can choose the version, current is totally fine. Now here is your platform, maybe Windows, and now you simply download it and install. So we are just double clicking here and installing it. But after this there are some additional steps, we must set up the data directory and here as you can see they are doing it inside command line like this and then like this. This is why you can install MongoDB like this, this is totally fine, this is the official way. But actually my students had a lot of problems while using databases with official installation. Why is that? Because actually in every single operational system you can have some problems, additionally you must create here a folder, then you must specify the path and so on, it is more difficult. This is why I highly recommend you to look on the second possibility, how you can install database on your machine. And I'm talking here about Docker and about Docker Desktop. So what is Docker? This is a specific additional tool which you should not learn, but you can simply use it. The main idea is that Docker packs everything inside a container. It is completely isolated there and it doesn't have anything to do with your operational system. Docker works on all operational systems and it is free. Which actually means the idea here that we are installing Docker, first of all on your machine, and secondly we use Mongo official image from Docker. As you can see here is the link for Mongo, which is supported by MongoDB itself, so this is not some third party tool, this is super official. And the main idea is that this Mongo is packed inside container, so it is completely isolated on your machine and you simply get from the container the port where you can connect and write data to this container. And this is how it will look like when you start in it. As you can see here on the left it must be green. And at this point you know ok my docker is running. And for you probably the list here will be empty, this is totally fine. The main idea is that first of all you start docker on your machine. After this we simply jump to the console and we must run such command. As you can see here I wrote docker run and after you install docker desktop on your machine you can write docker inside the console, this is the known name. And here we are writing docker run then minus d which means this must be a detached process, which actually means we don't want to run it here inside this terminal, we want just to detach it from the terminal. Here we specify ports and after this we are specifying name mongodb and here mongo. This name mongodb is the name of container on my machine and here what we want to download. This is exactly the image that we will use. And here we are using mongo 404, you can also use later version here you can check it on the official website of the Mongo or here inside Docker. As you can see you can click here tags, scroll a little bit, for example you can use latest or just check the version. As you can see here the latest version is 5.0.7. At this moment I installed on my machine 404, but it doesn't make that huge difference. The things that we will write inside MongoDB are the same on all these versions. 
Now I'm hitting here enter and docker will download this image on my machine. As you can see I didn't get any output at all except of one hash. And this is because MongoDB is already downloaded by docker on my machine. So this is not a problem and this line simply started MongoDB again on my machine. And actually if I am opening now the docker tool you can see here container MongoDB and it is green because it is running at the moment and we can speak to it. This is why as you can see you don't need to create additional files, you don't need to care about some permissions or folders, it simply works and this is a single line which I use for a lot of projects. Now the question is obviously how we can jump inside console of MongoDB when it is inside a container. And for this we have a special command docker exec which means execute it and here is the name of our container in our case it was MongoDB and after this we are writing our command and we want to command mongo here because this is what is installed inside container. Inside container can be installed whatever. In our case this mongo image simply has mongo inside. This is why we are hitting here enter and we are getting here lots of messages from mongodb. And as you can see after this I am now here in the terminal of mongo inside container and I can write here some mongo commands. For example show databases semicolon I am hitting enter and you can see what databases I have here inside. Now you might say, ok, but I didn't use docker, I installed mongodb just with official way. What should I do? And actually you must do just a single thing. If you installed it the official way, then you have two different commands in your console. First of all it will be mongod command and this will start exactly the same like we did with docker run mongodb process on your machine, which actually means the database will be as a process running on your machine. And the second command that you won't use is mongo. And this command will jump directly inside console just like we did with docker. It will be exactly the same. The most important in this course that your database mongo must be running directly on your machine during the development of the project. Which actually means you have really three things. First of all you have a started database. Secondly you have a started web server for the backend. And the last one is the started web server for the frontend. We are almost finished with setuping all our tools. And the last question that I want to ask you, do you really use the correct editor? Because actually we will write a lot of TypeScript inside your editor. And if your editor doesn't support TypeScript that well, then you might think about using another editor. As you can see here I am inside my editor, this is Vim, but I am not suggesting it to you. I just want to show what I am talking about. As you can see here we are inside component, inside Angular and here we have import of our component. Typically when we are writing the code we don't write imports, we just write something like add component or maybe just add then comp and then we have an autocomplete. And as you can see here we can choose a lot of stuff, we want actually to import component from angular. I am hitting just enter here and first of all it was autocompleted to the end and secondly I got this auto import component from angular core. And it is extremely important that your editor can do this. You really need support of these auto imports when you are writing code. Because every single time you must write an import. If you will really do it by hands like import component from and you don't really remember from what package you must import it, this is not efficient. You simply spend time that you can write code on wrong things. We really need this feature of auto import. And second feature is obviously you want to have a support of TypeScript inside your editor. Which actually means when we are writing something not correct, for example not selector here but just select, we are getting directly here a message. Argument of type select does not exist on type component. Which actually means we don't spend time debugging some magic, we simply see our typo directly inside editor. And you can use here any editor that has support of TypeScript, but if you don't know what editor to use, I highly recommend you to look on VS Code. This is completely free editor, which works on every single operational system, you simply install it, you are getting such editor with built-in support of TypeScript out of the box, which actually means you are getting all these features inside your editor. And in this case it is much smoother for you to write code. 
In this video we are starting with developing our project. And actually the goal of this video is to set up our backend server with Express, MongoDB and Socket.io. So let's start. And now here we must install several new packages. First of all we want Express, this is our framework. This is why I want to jump inside console. And as you can see we are inside root folder, this is wrong. We don't want to install here packages, because we first must jump inside our server folder. Here we want to install packages. This is why here I am writing npm install express. In this case we are installing this framework as a dependency. Here you can see now we have a new dependency express, this is our framework. The next thing that we want to install is Mongoose. And if you don't know what is Mongoose, this is the most popular package to work with MongoDB inside Node.js. Why it is most popular? Because you can simply set up your connection to the MongoDB with it, you can create your models and work with MongoDB in more correct way by working with models. So you typically have something like ORM. And we will learn Mongoose Tipe in the next lectures. And the last thing that we want to install here is Socket.io. This is why npm install socket.io and this is exactly our library to work with WebSockets inside Node.js. So as you can see all our dependencies are installed and now we can jump inside source server.ts. And we don't have anything here and we can start with configuring our server. But actually here is the question. It is really easy to just write your code for starting express server. And it is really easy to create a web server for Socket.io. But actually it is not that easy to configure together MongoDB, Express and Socket.io. Because what we want from Express, we want normal routes, just like a normal application. But we also want to bind to it Socket.io, so we can work with WebSockets. And additionally to all this, we need somehow to start our MongoDB. So as I said, it is not easy, but this is the production way. Because actually nobody needs just a single package, we really want the full-blown production-ready application. So first of all here I will import our Express from Express. And actually at this moment you probably think, okay, what he is doing? He is writing imports inside Node.js. And actually this is totally fine, because we are not writing here JavaScript. We are writing here TypeScript, and it is transpiled with our config. And just to remind you, here we have our TS config. It is transpiled to ECMAScript 6, which can be readable by Node.js. But most importantly, mode resolution is CommonJS and Node. This is why it will be converted to require and it will work like a charm inside Node.js. But for us it is extremely comfortable because using imports is much better than writing require. And here we have a next problem. As you can see here I have an error, cannot find the declaration file for module express. What does it ever mean? TypeScript tries to help us with imports, and he can't do it out of the box because TypeScript doesn't know anything about Express package. And here is a solution we must install with npm install save dev types express. So we can additionally install typings for Express package, and then TypeScript can help us more. And this is exactly what we want to do. We need to jump inside console and write npm install, and here is add types slash express and here is important minus the option to just install it as a dev dependency. We don't need this library on the production. And as you can see after installation this error is gone and now TypeScript can help us with express. So here we successfully imported our express package and now we can create our application. So I can simply write here const app equals and here we are calling express. And as you can see now if I am highlighting express, you can see all typings of express from this specific package. For example we can read here that it creates an express application. And this is extremely helpful for development purposes. The second thing that we want to do, we must create an HTTP server. And you will see why in a second. So here I want to the structure create server from and here will be HTTP. And as you can see we are getting HTTP out of the box and also create server because this is the default node package. 
but it might happen that you are missing typings for known chess, this is why we can jump directly in the console and write npm install types node minus d, and in this case we are installing for sure all typings which are needed for known chess. So here we imported create server from http, now we must use it. So after app we can create our http server, and here we want to call our create server and provide inside our app. And just to remind you, app, this is an instance of our express, this is our express server. And we are creating here our HTTP server additionally. The next thing that we want to import here is socket.io. This is why here we are importing server with big S from socket.io package. And now after this we can directly create our socket server. So here const io, and here we are calling new server, and inside we are providing our HTTP server. This is exactly why we created this HTTP server first and before our express. So now in this file we have three different things. First of all we have our app, so we can work directly with express. Secondly we have our HTTP server, which we can start with some port. And the third is our io, so we can make some WebSocket requests. And just to check that everything is working, I want to use here our app and just write app get slash. So we want to create our new route on slash. And here we don't need anything, but I just want to respond with some string. This is why here we can write request and response. And here inside res.send API is up. If you are not familiar with Express, this is how we create just plain routes inside our backend server. So here we are saying, ok, we are creating our get route for slash, which means for home page, and here is our callback. And inside our callback we are getting request and response, and here we can use res.send to send this string to this specific route. The last thing that we must do here is start our server. So here we can write HTTP server dot listen, and here we are providing some port, for example for 1001. After this we have a callback that our web server is successfully started. So we can write inside some console log, for example that our API is listening on port, and here will be our port. And actually it would be nice later to put this port in additional config file, but for now it will also go. So let's check if it's working. I have here a tab with opened API server. And as you can see here, no daemon restarted this web server again and again. And at some point now we are getting our console log, API is listening on port 4001. Which actually means if in browser we will open localhost 4001, you can see here our message API is up. But it is not all, we also want to check if our socket IO connection is working. This is why here after app we can write IO dot and here we have on. And as you can see first of all we are getting all typings out of the box with socket IO. We don't need to install any additional package. Secondly you can see that on adds a listener function to our socket IO. Which actually means we can write here on and we are providing here as a first parameter connection. And actually this is the default action that can happen inside Socket.io. And here we have our callback, we don't want anything for now here, but we can simply write console log connected. And we can't really see that Socket.io is working for us, because we just set it up on the backend, but not on the client. But this is a way how we will write our Socket.io code on the backend, and we are fully prepared for it. So here with app we are working with express, with io we are working with socket io, and the http server we are using to start the server. And the last thing that we must do here is set up our mongoose. And just to remind you, mongoose is the package to work with mongodb. So here on the top I want to import mongoose from mongoose. And now here is a really important point. You never want to start your web servers before you started connection to the database. The main idea is that inside your web server you will do some requests to the database. And if database is not ready yet, then we can't do this request. Which actually means every single time we want to be sure that MongoDB is there, connection is established, and only after this we are starting our web server. This is why here what I want to write after our socket IO, we can write here mongoose dot and we have here a method connect. And actually inside we want to provide our mongodb URL. 
So what I want to paste here is this URL. It is mongodb colon to slash s localhost 27017 port slash ltrello. And actually this part on the left is the default path of mongodb. And it doesn't really matter how you installed mongodb with the official way or with docker container, it will work exactly the same. Either you have a running MongoDB process on your machine on this port, or you have a running MongoDB inside a container with this port which is available outside on our local machine. And here after slash, this is just the name of our database, you can write here any name and it will be created. I just wrote here El Trello like the name of our project. So this line is actually a promise, this is why here we can write dot then, and only after we connect it successfully to our MongoDB database, then will be triggered. And now inside we can first of all write that we successfully connected to our database, so I can write here connected to MongoDB, and also I want to move this HTTP listen inside. In this case, first of all, our connection to MongoDB is established and after this we are starting our server. Now I want to jump inside our web server and check if it's working. As you can see now I am getting message connected to MongoDB and after this a message that our API was successfully started. Which actually means this is exactly our goal. First of all MongoDB, secondly our web server. And actually at this moment you might get some error regarding connection here. And the most popular problem that you might have, you didn't start your MongoDB process on your machine. If it is not started then we can't connect to MongoDB database. Then here you will probably get some error like cannot connect to MongoDB or connection failed. But if you see on your screen connected to MongoDB and API is started, this means that you configured everything successfully and we started our web server on the backend with MongoDB and Socket.io. In this video we will talk about creating our user model. Actually in our application we will register a user, so current user, we can log in with user, which means we need somehow to handle our users on the frontend, on the backend and inside database. So in this video we will focus on mongoose and database. Once again, what is mongoose? We already installed this package in our package.json, you can see mongoose here. But what it essentially does? This is the official website of mongoose, you can see here the example. So we inject here mongoose and we make mongoose.connect and here is our mongodb database. After this we can write mongoose model cat and we define that our cat has name string, which actually means cat is our entity. And now we can create this entity just inside JavaScript. This is why here we are writing new cat and we provide inside a name. So here we created a kitty, which is just an object. But now inside kitty we have a save method and this method returns us a promise. Which actually means this is how we will save the record inside MongoDB. Now you might ask, ok, why do we need mongoose? Why we can't simply use official MongoDB driver? Like mongodb.save and throw inside some object that we want to save. This is not comfortable to work in a huge project. Even in a medium project it is not that comfortable, because you don't have any abstraction. You are writing super low level code, how you need to save data to database or how you will read them. Actually this is why we prefer to use ORMs inside our backend projects. What ORM does for us? We define something like models which are our entities inside our project. For example we have a user, then we have maybe tasks, or you have boards if we are talking about Trello application and so on. And then we can define relations between these models. And then all these relations are done in much easier way than we can do it ourselves with MongoDB. Which actually means we simply write less code. This is why in this video we want to focus on our user model. And the first thing that I want to do inside source, I want to create types folder. And actually we are writing here TypeScript, which means we must leverage it. And this is super important to invest more time in TypeScript than in writing your code. In this case it will be easier for you to develop your application. This is why here in source types I want to create user.interface.ts. And as you can see here I have this notation where we have a postfix of what exactly it is. 
and inside I want to create our new interface user. And if you don't know TypeScript really well, this is just a definition of the object which we can use everywhere. In this case here we are using word interface, which is a reserved word inside TypeScript, and here we define an interface user, and we can define what fields we have inside our user. First of all, we must create an email, because actually email is what we are using in the application to register user, validate this user, and then send email to the user. Also, we need here a username, and it will be string. And password will be also needed. And obviously, we must hash our password and never store passwords just as a plain string. And last but not least, here will be created ad. We don't need to use this field, but it is really nice to have it, first of all for debugging purposes, and secondly, we can get it from Mongoose just out of the box. And it will be date. So this is how our user interface is looking like. And now in our whole application, in our backend side, we can use this user interface. Now on the right, I want to create a model for this user. This is why in source we can create new folder which is called models. And inside we can register user.ts and this is our model. This is exactly something for Mongoose. So what I want to write here is our user schema. And what it means, here we define a schema of our model. And for this we are using new schema. And as you can see I don't have any autocomplete. So let's try to import here schema. And as you can see, I don't have a correct import here. I have an auto import from inspector and this is not correct. So I will type here import schema from mongoose and let's check if we have an error. We don't have an error, which means this was just a problem of my editor. And here I can inspect the schema, which means it is really available with TypeScript inside. So here we are writing new schema and now inside round brackets we can define our object. But schema is not what we will use inside application, it should be a model. This is why here we can write at the end export default model and this model also comes from mongoose. So let's put here comma model and here model is a function where we provide our string, it will be user with big U and as a second argument we provide here user schema. And this is how we define a model inside Mongoose. So here we have export default model, we provide here a name and our schema, and here we must define our schema. But we are writing TypeScript, and actually it is not the best way to create new schema. Why is that? Here we highlight our schema and you can see a lot of any's here, and this is bad. Why is that? Because we didn't define any type of our schema. This is why what we want to do, we want create a definition of the schema for a user. So I want to jump here on the left and create here export interface, so it is a new interface for user document. And here is a huge difference, we have here an interface for the user, this is just user with the fields, and this is user document, this is what we are using just for mongoose. And here I want to write extends, and if you don't know what is extends, we simply take all fields from our user here. So I want to write here extends user, comma, document. And actually this document must be loaded from mongoose, so here on the top I need to write import document from mongoose. And actually for now we don't need to provide anything inside. And you might ask now, okay, but does it make any sense, what did we wrote here? We created an interface, user document, and here we simply extended user and document. And yes, it makes sense, because first of all we have our interface user, we can use it everywhere, this is our part. But we also mix it with the document, and document is coming from Mongoose. This is the definition of the document, and for us important part is for example this ID, because every single document inside Mongoose QDB has an ID, and in this case here we don't need to specify that our user has ID, it is coming from the document of Mongoose. And now we can jump here on the right, and after new schema we can provide in tags our user document that we just created. And now I can auto import it here on the top, so it is from our types user interface. In this case here we are saying that our user document is what we need to provide inside our user schema. And exactly the same we can do with our model, here we can provide our user document. 
And if you don't know what this part is meaning, this is actually a generic, which actually means here we are providing generic type, it can be whatever by default, it was any. But if we now inspect our schema, you can see that it is not any anymore. Here we have our user document. And this is extremely important for us and for TypeScript validation. Because actually here now inside what I want to do, I want to throw something which does not exist inside user. For example, let's say that we have inside user property foo, and here inside we want to provide that type is string. And I'm saving this and I'm getting here an error. That argument of type foo is not assignable to parameter of type. And here we can see our email, username, password, created at, underscore id, which is coming from document, and here to underscore version. Which actually means if we don't write this user document here, we don't get any validation of TypeScript. This is extremely important that we're getting it. Now inside we must provide all fields which are mandatory for our user. And let's start with the email. So here our field is email and inside we must provide it type, it is a string. Secondly, here we can say required property. And as you can see, TypeScript helps us and shows what properties we can provide inside Mongoose. So actually inside required, we can provide an array with some validator and message. Because actually we want to show on the front end a nice message when our email is not valid. So it is not just a string, this is invalid email. And for this we can import here on the top validator. So here I want to import validator from validator. And as you can see we are getting an error, module validator is not installed. So we must jump inside our server, here I am stopping web server, and I will write here npm install validator. But this is not all, we also want to get types for this package. This is why here add types slash validator, but it must be installed only in development mode. So here don't forget minus D. We can now open on the right our package JSON, and as you can see here in dev dependencies I have types validator and in dependencies validator. Now here we don't have any error for the validator, so we can specify it inside required. And actually here I am a little bit wrong, this is not a field required, because inside required we simply provide if it is required or not, in our case email is required, and here as a second parameter we can provide an error message if it is empty, and here we can provide email is required. And after this we have our validations. This is why here we have a property validate and this is exactly where we want to use our validator. So here I can write validator dot and we are getting nice autocomplete because of the types and here I will write is email. So here we have lots of validations and we are getting email validation out of the box. And as a second argument we can provide here invalid email. And last but not least I want to create indexes. And actually if you don't know what is indexes, these are things which can make your database requests faster and secondly it can make, for example, email field unique. In this case I want to write create indexes and here as an object I am providing inside unique true. What it does, it reads our email as unique index. In this case we can't save two people with the same email. So once again inside Mongoose schema we are providing all fields which we need for our user. And the first field was an email. And here we must provide a type inside and this is exactly the only line that we need by default. But actually we can provide here required which we can set in true or false. Here we can provide some validators and we can create indexes. And actually we can't do all this stuff just like this inside plain MongoDB driver. This is why I prefer to use Mongoose because it is an ORM where we are getting all these things out of the box. Our next field is our username. So here we can provide our username and it will be easier. First of all the type will be string and secondly required must be true. And here I also want to provide a validation error. This is why we will use the same notation with array. Here is true and username is required. Now we can copy paste this user because it will be the same and the last one what we have here is our password. And our password is type string and it is also required but here password is required and the last thing that we want to do is select false. And actually what select false is doing, it will never select this field when we are doing some requests. 
For example, we want to get a user by ID from the database. We won't get this field back. And this is extremely important because it makes our application safe. It doesn't matter what queries we are writing, we always know we won't get a password back, which means we are by default on the safe side. And last but not least, what I want to provide here is timestamps. So we can provide here inside an object and we can write here timestamps. And here we are setting it to true. In this case, our created at property will be directly generated by Mongoose. But as you can see here is a typo, we don't need to provide this object here. It is a second argument after our object. Which actually means in the new schema, as a function, we are providing first of all this object with all our fields, and secondly the object with timestamps true. So this is the second argument of our new schema. So we are ready with the first part of our model. But we have a really huge problem here. If we will just try to use our user like this, for example here we can write new user, and we are providing inside an object with email username password, and after this we will call save, then our user will directly save this password as plain string. This is forbidden, this is wrong, and we should never do this. This is why we must fix this issue. What we can do about it, we must hash our password before we will store it in the database. And for this we can use a really nice library which is called bcrypt, and this is the most popular solution to hash the password. This is why we must jump inside console and install this package, so npm installed, bcrypt, js, and we also want to install typing, so here add types slash bcrypt.js. But obviously it must be with minus D. So let's check this out. I'm jumping to package JSON and here I see types bcrypt.js in dev dependencies and bcrypt in dependencies. This is completely correct. Now what we can do here, we can define user schema dot pre and this is the possibility to run some function before something. And here we are interested to provide save which actually means we will run our function directly before save. So here I want to write a sync function and I will say why I'm using here function and not arrow function in a second. It is really important to write it like this. And here we are getting next. And now here we have a brackets and we can do something inside. The main idea is that we can do whatever we want here with our object and after this when we change this object for example, we must call next and then mongoose will proceed with saving of our data. And presave means that this function will be called first of all after create and secondly after update. And this is exactly what we want. For example, we want not just create a password for the user, but also update it later in update form. And the first condition that I want to write here is like this. If not this dot is modified and as you can see we have a function is modified and we can provide inside word password then we want just to not do anything and return next so what we are doing here we are checking if our password field was modified it is not the case with create because there we will have a password but it is a case with update if we just change user and we didn't change the password then it doesn't make any sense to apply this function this is why here we are checking okay if password field is not modified then we simply say for mongoose go ahead now as you can see here we wrote a sync function and not an error function and it is important here because we want to use here this property and to have a correct this reference we must write it as a function and not an error function because in other case this will be wrong. And also we used here a sync function because bcrypt operation will be asynchronous. So after this I want to write try catch. And actually if we will get some error with bcrypt, then we are coming inside catch, here we are getting our error, and we want to return this error inside next. So here we are throwing inside error as error. And you might ask, okay, but why this strange notation error as error? Actually, if you will try to just write like this, we will get an error. Argument of type unknown is not assignable to parameter of type callback error or undefined, which actually means inside catch, every error is unknown, which is obvious because this is catch and we don't know what error happened. This is why we are writing catch. But actually we can't use error like this and we can't provide it inside next. This is why we must convert a type of our error to something meaningful. In this case I am using as 
this error and we can provide errors inside next function. This is exactly what we are doing here. Now we must write our logic to hash a password and for this I want on the top to import our bcrypt.js module. So I am importing bcrypt.js from bcrypt.js and now inside our try we can first of all get a salt. And if you don't know for bcrypt we are generating first salt and then we provide it in bcrypt function to hash a password. This is why here we need to get a salt and for this we are calling bcrypt.js.gensalt. As you can see this is a function which asynchronously generates for us salt. And here we can provide 10 for example. And this is an asynchronous function, this is why here we must write away it. So it will get for us salt and now here we must update our password. And actually this function is called before we saved this record. Which actually means with this we have a reference to all fields that we are trying to save. And here I will write this dot password to change our field that we are trying to save. And here we want to assign a weight bcrypt.js.hash and actually hash as you can see here will hash our password. And inside we first of all must provide our password, it is this password and secondly salt. In this case our password will be hashed and we will just store a hash inside our database. In this case after we will call next and we must do it for sure, this password will be updated and we will save the clean record. This is why inside we want to write return next and we simply call it. This will trigger the saving of our record to database. And most important part that we wrote this logic inside model. So this logic we saving is completely isolated inside model and when we will write some code which is related to the user we won't even know about this logic. It is all inside the model. It doesn't have anything to do with finding a user or saving a user. It is what is happening inside model. And the last thing that we need for future is the function validate password. Why do we need it? Because actually when we will try to log in a user we want to compare not only email but also provided password. And we have a really nice thing which is called methods inside mongoose. So here we can write user schema methods and here we want to create a new method for example validate password. And actually it is working in exactly the same way like for example methods inside classes. So we can call on our instance of our user this method validate password. And here we must provide a function and again I am not writing here arrow function but just a function. And here inside we are getting password as a parameter. Because actually when we want to compare a password we will provide something that we want to compare. This is why here password is a string. And here inside we want to compare the provided password with our password inside our instance. So here we can simply return bcrypt.js.compare and this is a function to compare first of all a plain password which is provided from outside and secondly our string and this is this.password that we are storing as a hash inside our record. So our later usage will look like this. We are writing here for example that we have a user and we want to save it. So here we have new user and we must provide inside our email. Then we must provide here a username and then we will provide here a password. After this we will try to save a user. So here we will call user.save. And actually after calling this thing our presave will be called and we will store correct password. But after this line we can also write user.validate password and here we can provide any password that we want to compare. And this function will return for us true or false depending on the correctness of the password. And this is fully correct to do all this stuff inside user model and not inside some controllers where we simply work with users. Because in this case our logic is completely isolated inside user. And now we are missing just a single line. Here inside our types user interface we defined user document. But actually we must specify inside this user document that we wrote here a new method validate password. This is why what I want to do here I want to create a new method inside validate password. And we know that inside we are getting some parameter. We can just name it param1 and this is a string. And we know that back we are getting a string. In this case our user document is completely correctly typed and we can use it later inside TypeScript to call this validate password method and get autocomplete.
In previous video we successfully created our user model, and they can understand that previous video was really dry, because we just created a model and you didn't see how we used this model in a real application. This is why the goal of this video is to create our register method, which means we will register a user, and this is exactly how we will use our user model. So let's look on our code. For now we have just a model inside source models, and what we want to build is MVC architecture. What does it ever mean? Actually inside Express as a framework we don't have any architecture. In Express we simply define some routes, start web server and we are good to go. We don't have a lot of rules which are defined inside Express. This is why we must do something on our own, and the really popular architecture which suits nicely our backend project is MVC. MVC, which actually means model view and controller. And actually in 90% of the cases we will just use models and controllers. We won't use any views, just because we are working and creating an API, and we don't need to render views there, we just respond with the JSON and this is it. This is why my idea is to create here a new folder, which is called controllers. And the main idea is that here inside server.ts we register all our routes. For example, here we have a route for the home page. The main idea is that we are not writing the logic of this route here directly as a callback. We will write it inside specific controller, which actually means all our requests we want to split in different controllers. For example, we have a user controller, and there we are writing all our actions regarding registration, login in, getting user, login out, and so on. Then we have a board controller where we will write inside everything which is related to board. The most important part is that inside model we define how we are working with the database, so we create our entity like user. But inside controller we are using this entity and we are building some responses of our API. Which actually means we are separating our logic. Everything with database is going to models, but we are using models inside controllers. So this was the theory, now let's create our first controller. And for this I want to register here a new route. And it will be a route for registration, this is why here we have app post, and the URL will be slash API slash users, and here will be our users controller dot register. So our first rule here is that all our URLs will start with slash API, because actually it is really nice to have a namespace for our API. Secondly, as you can see we are not importing something like register, we are importing here the whole user's controller, and we need to have some good naming. And the typical naming for controllers is always with S at the end, for example user's controller and not user controller. Now let's import star as user's controller. And if you don't know what this star is doing, the main idea is that inside we will have a bunch of functions, and this star as groups all these functions inside this object, and then we can write something like user's controller dot register. So here we want to import it from, and here we have our controllers slash, and here we will create file users. And as you can see it doesn't make any sense to name this file users controllers because this file is situated directly inside controllers. This is why here let's jump inside controllers and here is users.ts and this is our file which is a controller and inside we write all actions which are related to the user entity. Now on the right I want to open our server.ts and as you can see actually this part that you can see here is what we are writing inside controller. So this is our callback. And as you can see this is just a plain function with request response and the third parameter here can be next. This is why what I want to do here I want to create a function which is called register and this is an asynchronous function. Why we need here an asynchronous function because we will work with database and all requests for our database are asynchronous. And here we are getting as an argument, first of all request, secondly response, and the last one is next. And this is just a function. So this is exactly the same what we are pasting here directly, but we just moved it outside inside our controller. 
But this code is bad. Why is that? Because actually here we didn't type our request, response and next. So here I can write colon and here we have our request. And this is the most important part. Here we have request, which is coming from fetch API. We don't need it. What we need is request, which is coming from express. This is why here import request from express. And as you can see, now we have completely different definition. We have here inside dress body, request body, and this is exactly what we need. Also, we need here not only request, but response. And I'm importing here also response and typing here response as a response. And the last one is not next, but next function. And here auto import is correct. It is from express. So this is how we typically will create any action of the controller. Doesn't matter if it is user controller or it is some article controller, it will be always the same. Now directly inside I want to write try catch. Why is that? Because actually we will write asynchronous code with async await inside this function and we want to handle all errors. And the easiest way with express to handle an error is by using next. And we already used it previously inside our model. And here it is working exactly the same. So we can write here try and we have catch and we are getting some error. What we want to do, we want to call here next and throw inside the error. This is it. Actually, this is a single liner which will propagate our error to express and then express will show this error on the screen. Now inside we want to create a user because actually this is a registration and registration means simply creating a user. This is why here I want to import user model from and here we have our models slash user model that we created previously. And as you can see here, I didn't name it user with capital U, but user model. This is just to be crystal clear inside our code that we are working with model. And now we can use this model inside. So we can write here const and here is new user because here we want to register new user and we're writing here new user model. And now inside we must pass some data. In our case, we must pass here email, then username and password. So here we want to write that we want to set an email and this is request.body.email. Then we want to set here username and this is request.body.username. And the last one is password and it is request.body.password. But here we have a huge problem. By default, Express can't work with body and by default, Express won't parse it at all. This is why what we must do, we must install additional package for this. And this package is called body parser. This is why I will jump inside the console and be aware here I am inside server and I will write npm install and here we want to install body parser. I am hitting enter and the package is installed. Now we can start our server again and jump back. So the main idea is that here inside server TS, I will import my body parser. So here let's name it body parser with camel case and we're importing it from package body parser. Now somewhere here before we're doing our routes, we can write app use and inside we want to write body parser.json. And actually here you can directly check what body parser JSON is doing. And it returns a middleware that only parses JSON. And this is exactly what we want. We want to parse our JSON. But it is not only this. We also want one more app use, body parser. And here will be dot, URL encoded. And inside we are providing extended true. So what these two lines are doing? First line will just look for content type application JSON and then parse our body in the JSON. So we can work with our body as an object and this is extremely easy. The next line will do exactly the same but for URL encoded strings. And then we will also get our body. So with this configuration in every project you can work normally with the API where you have body as a JSON. And this is exactly what we are doing here. We are reading body from request. Now I want to console log here our new user so we can check how it looks like. And after this, I want to try and save the user. So here we can write saved user and here we can call await new user dot save. So this single liner will create for us new user inside database. This is why here I want to console log saved user comma saved user. Now I want to use such tool which is called postman to make requests. 
And if you don't have Postman on your machine, you can simply jump to Postman.com and download it here. It is completely free, it has paid tiers, but we don't need them for our course. So here how it looks like and actually what we want to do, we want to make a post request to our URL. And here we have our local host 4001 slash API slash users. Now here we must jump to body and select here raw. And on the right we can say that this is a JSON. Now what we want to pass inside is an object with three fields. First of all we have here email, for example foo at gmail.com. Then we have our username field, for example foo. And we have our password field, for example 123. Now let's send a request and check if it's working. As you can see the request hangs and this is completely normal. Because actually here we didn't call rest.json for example, this is why it is hanging. But now we can jump inside console and this is our output. First of all here we can see our new user, this is before saving. So this is what we have after calling new user model. Which actually means we are throwing inside these three fields and we are getting user from mongoose. And as you can see, the main difference of our object is that we have here an ID, which is a MongoDB ID, and it was automatically generated for us. And actually after this, we can use this new user and save it, for example, to database with .save method, which is extremely easy. And the most important part is here saved user. This is our saved user, which comes from the database. How we can tell that it is already saved? First of all, here we see our password. And actually our password here, we gave like one to three, but here we didn't save it like one to three. It is a hashed password. Why it is happening? Because actually we defined the model and here we have a method pre-save. And just to remind you here, we generated a hash from our password and we saved this hash with bcrypt instead of password. And this is extremely important pattern. We don't want to write here any logic regarding changing the password to the hash. It doesn't make any sense because we want to define model with some logic and then it happens magically because it is defined there. In this case, here we save, we just changed our password in hash and inside our controller we don't know anything regarding it. The same goes about these fields created it and updated it. These two fields were added for us because here we defined timestamps true. So our user was successfully saved to MongoDB, but actually we can't just throw the saved user as a response. Why is that? First of all, we don't need all fields and for sure we should never give this password outside. And actually just to remind you here inside our models user, we said that password is not selected. It is selected false, but actually after we saved user here, this password is given for us back. And actually if we are doing some find, we won't get a password field, but after saving the user, we obviously is getting it. This is why we must create a nice response which fits our needs. This is why here I want to create additional function normalize user. And here we are getting user and we know that this is user document. And as you can see our user document, we can import from types user interface. Just to remind you, user document is just our user object with ID and validate password method. And as you can see here, we can inspect new user and we can see that this is user document and ID property. This is exactly what we are passing here. And here inside this function, we want to return the normalized for API user. So first of all, here we will have an email. This is user.email. Then we want our username. It will be user.username. And the last one is ID. It is user.id. And just to remind you, in MongoDB, all IDs are stored with underscore ID. But actually here inside Mongoose, we can use them in both ways, like underscore ID and like dot ID. This method already exists and it simply references underscore ID. So our normalize user function is completely ready. And now we can call here it when we respond with this saved user. So I can simply write here res send. And inside we are passing normalize user and here is our saved user. Let's check if it's working. We don't have any errors here in web server. 
I will open here Postman and hit send again. And as you can see, we successfully normalized our user and we didn't get here, for example, password back, which is extremely important. But here is something that I don't like about our responses. Actually, we did some validation inside our model, but if I will remove here username and hit send, we're getting here 500 and this is actually HTML page with some validation here. This is not what we want. What we can do here, we can use the sketch and read messages from our error. But the main problem is that our error is not always validation error. It can be for example 500, but we can also get validation errors. And the most correct way to check it inside TypeScript is like this. We are writing here that our error is instance of error dot validation error. But here it is important to import error correctly, because we want to import this error from Mongoose. So here I am importing our error from Mongoose. In this case it will be treated correctly, because actually here error.validationerror is a class of Mongoose, and if we got any validation errors of Mongoose, we can work with them here. Now let's just write inside console log error, and check what we are getting here. I will hit send again and as you can see inside console we are getting here errors and this is an object, which actually means we can read messages from this object and show them on the screen. So here I want to create a property messages and here we can write object.values which will read all values from our object and inside we are throwing error.errors, this is exactly what we are getting from Mongoose. And we want to go through every single field and here we are getting error and we just need error.message. So this will be an array of strings and now we can simply write return res status for example 422 which means unprocessable entity and here dot json messages which actually means here when we are getting any validation messages we are answering with this status and we are showing these error messages. We don't have any errors in the console so let's try again. I'm hitting here send and we are getting nice error messages. Username is required. Why it is happening? Because here we checked inside catch for instance of the class, we normalized our messages here and we responded with them. And actually it makes a lot of sense to move this function later to some helper because we will do exactly the same stuff again and again where we have mongoose validation. And here is the last step that we want to do. We actually need for our client to provide a token, which actually means when our user is logged in, we generate a unique token to make a GVT authentication. What does it mean? We have a special string GVT token, which we are throwing on the client, and then client can attach this GVT to the header, and later we will check if the request is authenticated, and if user is allowed to do some changes. But in this video we simply need to throw inside our response the GVT token that we will generate. And for this we must install additional package. So here I will write npm install json web token. And it is not only it, we also want to get typing, so here will be add types slash json web token. So we installed two packages and I restarted my web server. Now let's jump back and here we want to import now our json web token or just gvt. So let's write here import gvt from json web token. And now what we want to do here inside normalize, and this is the best place to do it, because here we have the whole user and we are building something which is not related to the database, so we want to generate here our token. And for this we are just calling gvt.sign and inside we must provide a payload and some secret key. So what do we throw inside payload? Here first of all we want to get an id and this is user.id and then an email, it is user.email. Actually it is enough for us to provide just an id so we can find later user by id but email is also nice to have for some validation and understanding who is this user. And what is secret here? It is just some random string which will help us to decode and encode tokens. So what we want to do actually, we want here inside our server source to create a new file, for example config.ts, and here we will store all such needed properties, like for example secret. 
So here I just want to export const, our secret property, and I will name it secret. Obviously for production reasons you want to have here something more secure, maybe some long hash like 12 symbols or so. And now we can use the secret here just by importing our secret from, and here we have our config file. Now instead of this secret or private key, I will just write a secret. So what this line does, it generates a token, which is just a string. And now we need to add here to our response the token. Let's check if it's working. We don't have any errors. Let's jump inside Postman and hit send. As you can see here, I must provide my username. So for example, foo. Let's check this out. Here we get all our fields and also token. And as you can see, our token is just a unique string that we will attach to all our requests on the client and decode back on the backend, which we will do in our next videos. So we successfully implemented our registration method, also with validation and with normalization for our API. In previous video, we fully implemented our register method. In this video, we want to implement loginning of our user. But actually, I want you to try and do it yourself, because it will be super similar to registration, and we already prepared everything. So what do you need to do at all? First of all, inside server.js, you want to create a new route. And actually, here we already have our route for registration. Now we must create one for loginning. For example, we can create a string slash API slash users slash login. Now here inside controller we must create new method login. The question is obviously what we will get there and what this method must do. And actually inside postman we can just try to use it. So here you will have slash login and instead of email, username, password, we simply throw to our request email and password. We don't have username because this is login in and our email is unique. And here you have two possible variants how you can implement it. First variant is easier, you simply want to read an email from the body and you want to try and find the user inside database and return this user back. And actually don't forget to use normalize user because we need that token also. And if you want more difficult approach, then you can also try and validate not only email, but also password. And for this, we have a validate method inside our model. But even if you try to do the first step on your own, this is totally fine. If you want to implement one of them, just pause the video now. And now let's do it together. So our first step will be to jump inside our server.ts and here we want to create a new route. So we have here a post because this is a post request for login in and here we have slash API slash users slash login. And here is our users controller dot login method, which we will create in a second. Now I will jump inside controllers user and I won't copy paste anything because we want to try and write it from scratch. So here we have our login method and we know that this is an asynchronous method where we get our request, which is request exactly like on the top inside registration. Secondly, we have here our response, which is type response. And the last one is next. This is next function. And now here inside our function, we want to write try and catch. So inside catch here, we will get our error and I just want to propagate it to next error. Why is that? Because actually here we won't have any validation rules. We will just check our validation inside our try and not inside catch. What do we need to do inside try? So here we are getting our request body with email and password inside. And our first step is try to get this user inside the database. So here we can write, okay, we need our user and we try with await user model dot find one and as you can see here we have find by id find and find one so actually user model dot find tries to find all documents as an array by some predicate for example here we can find a list by is active field and here find one will do the same but find just a single record this is what we want to use and sometimes we will need to find an element by id here we have a nice find by id method and as you can see here, we also have lots of other methods, like for example, find one and delete and update and so on. But for now, we will use find one and inside we must give a predicate as an object. And here we have our email and this is request 
body email. So actually this single line will try to find our record inside users collection by this email. And here as you can see we are getting user document. But actually this is not true because we can get here now and not a document because maybe this email does not exist. This is why here I want to check if we don't get a user then we want to throw an error. And for this we can simply return our response.status and here we have 42 status just like previously and here we want to throw some JSON back. And actually here we don't have different validations. In any case we simply throw invalid login or password. This is why here on the top I can create and save to the object our errors. So here I want to create errors. This is an object with field email or password for example. And here the value is incorrect email or password. So the main point is that we have exactly the same structure of our errors just like we have in all other places. And here we are just returning our errors back inside a JSON if we don't have a user. Now after this we can respond with our user. So here rest send and here we can call our normalized user and we are providing inside user that we found. And actually if you wrote this code even without this error check you are golden because you tried to do something by yourself. Now let's check if this code is working. So I don't have any errors here inside web server. Let's open our postman and hit send. And as you can see here actually it is already working. Here is our slash API slash user slash login. This is post request with our two fields. And here we are getting back the correct user with the token. And actually if here our email does not exist, we are hitting send and we are getting an object with email or password, incorrect email or password. Which actually means we successfully implemented our login of the user. But here we are missing just one small thing and this is validating of the password. But this is extremely easy to use just because we already prepared everything inside our model. And just to remind you inside our user model here on the bottom we have this validate password method. And we are using here bcrypt compare where we are comparing the password of the user with some string. This is exactly what we want to do here. We can just create a variable is same password and here we want to call user dot validate password. And as you can see we have here autocomplete of the TypeScript and actually we are getting this autocomplete just because inside our user interface document we wrote this line. If you didn't write this line here then you won't get this autocomplete. So here we have our validate password and inside we want to provide a string to check if it is correct. And this is request body password. And actually if these passwords are equal then we will get here boolean. But as you can see we are getting a string which means something is wrong. Let's check our interface validate password returns string. It is wrong. It should be boolean here. Now is same password returns for us boolean and here we can write some condition. For example if not is same password then we want to throw exactly the same error. So I will copy paste here res send status 42 json errors. Let's check this out. I'm hitting here send and we're getting this nice user. But what will happen if we will throw here incorrect password? I'm hitting here send and we're getting an error. So let's look inside console. And here we're getting quite a strange message illegal arguments string undefined. And as you can see here in our stack trace it is coming from our controller and here from our source model ts line 44. So let's jump inside our model ts line 44. As you can see this is our bcrypt compare. The question is what is the problem? This is why what we can write here is validate password and here we have first of all our password and this password. And actually I just want to see here this to know that we are on the safe side. Our server is restarted so let's check this out. I am hitting send and let's look inside console. And as you can see here before an error we see first of all validate password. This is our string and here is our object. 
But as you can see in this object, we don't have password. This is why we can't compare our object with the password because we don't have a password. Why we don't have it? Because actually here on the top, we said for the password, select false, which is completely correct. In 99% of the cases, we don't want to select a password because this is safe. But actually, in this specific case, in this login method, we can't work without password, because we need to compare our password of the user. This is why what we can do, we must tune this find one, so it also gets a password. And for this we can write dot select, here is a string, and inside we are writing plus password. And actually this is a really nice notation, because we can use here plus password, minus biography, and so on, if we want to remove or add specific fields. In this case, just for this specific request, we are getting not only the whole user, but also password field. And now if we will try again, I'm hitting send, we can check inside console, and now we are getting our user with password, which is hash, and now we don't have any error, but it is not working correctly, because here I have a wrong password, and we still are getting user. Why it is happening? And actually if here we will look on our validate password method, we are using here bcrypt compare. The question is what we are getting back, and here we can see in the typings, we are getting promise boolean. And this is extremely important, this is an asynchronous operation, it is not synchronous. This is why here we must jump back inside our types, user interface, and here we can't say that we are getting back boolean, it is actually promise of the boolean. And now it is completely correct. Because now if we will jump inside our controller, here we have user validate password, we see that we are getting back promise boolean. And now is same password is promise boolean, which is not what we want. This is why here we can write await, and this will resolve our promise, and here we will get our boolean. As you can see, TypeScript really helps us a lot in understanding correct typings, and we can always check what type we have. So here we are getting is same password, and now it should work. Let's check this out, inside Postman, I am hitting send and we are getting a message, email or password are not correct. And here with the correct password, 1 to 3, we are getting back our user, and this is exactly our implemented login request. In this video I want to talk about middlewares. So what is middleware? Typically when we are making a request from the client to the backend, we simply throw this request inside our route and then inside controller. This is exactly what we did here inside our source server. So here we have two post requests, register and login, and we simply jump inside our controller. Which actually means here inside controller we are getting request and response. Middleware is something which can be called before we are getting here. Which actually means middleware is being applied on the backend, but before our request is calling inside our controller or inside our route callback. Why do you need middlewares at all? If you need to do something with request before this request is getting to the controller, this is exactly when you need a middleware. What middleware do we need in our project? This is authentication middleware. Why do we need it? Just imagine that every single time when we need to do something with registered user, we need to check his token. Which actually means in every single method, like for example here register, we are getting the token of the user, we must parse this token, we must validate this token, and we must find current user with this token. And it doesn't make any sense to write this code in every single controller action. This is why we must create a middleware which we will reuse everywhere. This is why I want to jump here inside source folder and create here a new folder which is called middlewares. And here we can store all our middlewares. And the first middleware that we must create is auth.ts. And actually what is middleware? This is just a function. This is why here I want to export default and a synchronous function. And you might ask, okay, but why it is a synchronous? We simply get here our request and we then do something with it. 
because actually here we want to also work with the database. If we have a token and this token is valid, we want to read an ID of the user from this token and get this user from the database, so we can use this user that we already prepared inside our controller later. This is why it is an asynchronous function, and here we are getting request, response and next, exactly like we did previously. So here let's type our request, then we have our response, and the last one here will be our next function, which will be next function from our express. And here I will import on the top our request and response. And this function does not return anything, this is why it is a void function. And inside this function we want to read a token from our request. But I want directly to wrap all our code with try catch. Why is that? Because we will try to make some asynchronous request to our database and it might fail. This is why here it is a good approach to write try catch where we are getting our error and inside catch we just want to make rest and status and here will be 401. And you might ask, ok, but why we didn't show an error here? Because actually we don't care. This is a middleware to check authentication. If for some reason we can't parse a token, token is invalid, we couldn't find this user. In any case, it means that our user is not logged in. This is why here we send directly our 401 status. Now here we must read our status. So here I want to create auth header. And we can get our header from request.headers.authorization. And actually this means that we will store our token inside our authorization header. And actually a typical approach how we implement our GVT authorization is we have here authorization key, this is our header, and the value here will be bearer space token. So here we will have some unique string. This is why we must split our token accordingly. But first of all here we read our header, and it might be that it is not set. In this case we simply can say 401. This is why here if we don't have our auth header, we simply can copy paste this line with rest and status 401. After this we really need to parse our token, so here we will get our token, and this is auth header split, and this is just a string which we split by space, so we are getting an array with two elements, as you can see here in the first position we will have bearer, and on the second position it will be our string, what we want to get. This is why here I will take the second element of the array, and it will be our token. But as you can see here, we are getting a message from the TypeScript that object is possibly undefined. And this is why I like TypeScript so much, it helps a lot during development. What is the problem? Actually here we have our if and rest send status, which actually means we won't come here. But TypeScript understands that we will come here, because actually we didn't write here return, and this is why this code is invalid, because in this case here our header can be string or undefined, but after this correct check with return, it can be only a valid string. So the next step that we need to do is verify our token by using GVT. This is why here I want to import GVT from JSON Web Token, and just to remind you, this is a library which we used to generate a token on the backend, and now we need to validate it. This is why here we can just write that we are getting some data from our token, and here will be GVT verify, and inside we are passing first of all a token, secondly our secret key, and just to remind you, here inside our config we have our secret. This is why here I will just write secret and it will be auto imported from our config. And we don't need to provide here any additional options. But if we will check here our data is string or GVT payload. But actually we know that this is not correct, this is not what we are storing inside. If we will look here inside our controller users, here we generated our token and inside we have ID and email, which actually means it is valid here to say after GVT verify as, and here we can say that we are getting back an object with ID string and also our email, which is a string. In this case here now in data we are getting correct data back, this is an object with id and email. So we are getting here the id of the user and now we can try and fetch it from the database. But for this we need to use our model, this is why here on the top we can import our user model from 
our models. So here we can jump back inside our models slash and here we have our user. Now after our data we can make a request to get a user back. And actually here we are using await, here we will have user model dot and here we want to find user by id. And we have this function by default inside mongoose. And here instead of id we can write data dot id. And this user will be there or it might be null. This is why we also need to check it. If we don't have a user back, then we want to also say that user is not locked in. But if everything is fine, then we want to set inside request our user. So actually the main idea is that this request will be updated by us here and then later when we are calling next, this request will get to our controller and there we will have direct access to this user. This is why here I want to write request user equals user and this is this user that we got from the database and after this we must just call next and this line is saying that we are ready with our middleware and our request can proceed to our controller. But here we have a problem, as you can see here we are getting an error, property user does not exist on type request. And actually it is completely valid, this request is coming from express and inside express there is no field user. So what we can do here? The wrong approach will be to write here any. And I highly recommend you to avoid using any in your projects because then TypeScript can't really help you. You simply have your code with holes of plain JavaScript. This is why here res as any will be a super bad approach. Why is that? Because here we simply say we don't care what is about request, we simply say it is any.user and it is working. This is the beginner approach, we are not writing code like this. Here request user is totally fine, but this request should not be a request from express, we must extend it. And actually here inside types we can create a new type and let's name it express request dot interface dot ts. Now inside I can create this new interface and let's name it express request interface. And actually it must extend, so here is extends request. And actually this request will come directly from express. So here on the top I can write import request from express. So what we are doing here, actually we simply created an interface and we extended everything that we had inside request to our interface. And now here we can simply say that we have a field user which might be undefined and this is our user document. And here you might ask, okay, but why user can be undefined? Here we don't have a case where inside request user is undefined. And you are totally right, but we are not using middleware with every single request. Sometimes we won't have user inside our request because not every single request must be authorized. And now we can just copy paste this express request interface and jump inside our middleware and put it here instead of request. So now I need to import express request middleware and we are not using request from express anymore, we are using directly our extended version. And now we don't have any errors and what we are getting here is complete request from express plus our user field. And this is exactly the correct approach to use TypeScript. So we successfully created our middleware, now we need to use it. And for this I want to create a new route where we will get current user by token. So let's jump back inside source server and here we have two post URLs. Here now I want to create app get and we have here slash API slash user. This is the route to fetch current user. And now after this with comma I want to write auth middleware. And actually in this file we didn't declare what is auth middleware. So we need to import here auth middleware from our middlewares. So here we have middlewares, auth. And this is exactly what we will do. If you are writing like this, then you will apply this middleware before we are calling here controller. And here we will get our users controller dot, for example, current user action. Which actually means, first of all, in this route, this auth middleware will be executed. If we will get a user and request is going to the controller, then we are jumping here. And as you can see with Express, it is quite easy to read and understand. Now I want to jump inside our users controller and create this new method. So let's on the bottom create our new function, which will be current user. 
And here we know that we are getting request and response. But important part here, we are not using request from express, we are using our extended version. So here I will write that we are getting express request interface, and the next parameter here will be res response, it is staying the same like previously, and here inside our function we must apply some logic. What we want to do here? Actually, inside current user, we can directly get this user from the request. So here we can say res.send normalize user, just like we did on the top, and here will be request.user. And actually, it will work mostly. Because what we are doing here, we are using our user from the request, we throw it inside normalize user, and just to remind you, we have normalize user here on the top, and this is just a normal user document. And we generate here token, our response, and we send it back. But actually here we have TypeScript. What does it mean? Here we are getting an error, argument of type user document or undefined is not assignable to user document. And this is completely valid because we said that inside our request we don't always have a user. And actually the point is that this logic will never happen, because inside our server here we wrote this middleware, which actually means if we don't have user, then this auth middleware will return for 0, 1. But TypeScript doesn't care about out middleware because it simply reads our function. And if we are just looking on our function without out middleware, then our code is invalid. Why is that? Because here we are trying to throw undefined inside normalize user. And to handle this for TypeScript, we must write here if we don't have a user, then we want to throw for 0, 1. So here we can write return res send status and here inside 401. In this case it is completely valid for TypeScript because here in request user it can't be undefined. We did this check here. And actually this code is much better because in this case here we have this single function and we can completely test it in isolation. We don't care in this function what we did outside with additional functions, middleware or whatever. We simply know that this function will work correctly in every single case because we covered all cases here. So our function must be correctly implemented, let's check if it's working. I'm jumping to the server and we have some error. Let's check what we have. And actually here you can see that it was the error of TypeScript and the last compiling was successfully. We started the web server, connected to MongoDB and here is our API. So we can jump directly to Postman and try to make a GET request. But inside our request we must provide a token. This is why here I will copy paste a token because we must use it. And for this I will create here GET request and this is slash API slash user and I'm just hitting here send. And as you can see, we're getting here unauthorized. Why is that? Because inside authorization, we didn't provide a valid token. But if instead of this string, I will paste our token, so bearer, then space, and then we have our string, I'm hitting here send, and it magically worked. And here we're getting our normal user with the token. But most importantly is that we didn't write all this logic with getting current user here inside this method, it is written inside middleware. And now we can use our middleware in every single place where we want to check for current user or if we need the current user information inside our controller. In previous videos we already prepared some requests of API for our registering user and getting current user. So now it would be nice to start implementing something on the front end. This is why here I want to jump inside our client and here I want to start with our user module. And what we will have in our user module is two pages, loginning and registering. But it is not enough to just have two pages for registering and loginning. Inside our auth module we also need a service to work with current user. For example, we need to register user, login user, get current user and so on. And obviously we need an interface for our current user also. This is why in this video let's focus on creating basics of our authentication module. And for this I want to jump inside our source app folder and here I want to create new auth folder. And here we want to isolate everything which is speaking about authentication, registration or loginning. And our first step here is to create a module. And if you are not that familiar with Angular, just two words about modules inside Angular. 
Inside other frameworks, like for example React, we simply use imports and exports, but inside Angular we have much more, we have dependency injections, which actually means the whole application is split in different modules, for example in our case we are defining here a nouth module, now we can create different things inside this module, and they will be isolated inside this module, and we can define what we want to expose to use outside, and if we did didn't expose anything for using outside, then we can't just use this stuff from this module. And this is really a nice approach for huge applications. So let's create first of all our auth module. And for this we need to export our class auth module. Now on the top of this class we want to provide an ng module decorator. And inside we will pass different things. But for now we don't need to register anything here yet. What I want to do now, I want to jump back inside our app module, because actually we must register this auth module inside our app module. In other case, this module is not binded to our application, because we are just loading app module and we must load all children modules also inside it. This is why here inside imports we can simply write auth module. And with this line we are getting auto import here on the top, and now we are sure our module is loaded. Our next step here is to create current user interface. And from my point of view it is completely related to the auth module. So here we can create new folder types and register here current user dot interface dot ts. And inside our express project we didn't have any rules about file naming, because there we had just express and everything that we are writing we simply write with our own guidelines. Inside Angular it is highly recommended to name all our file names with dot and then postfix of the entity. For example here we wrote auth.module because it is an auth module. In this case we are writing here dot interface because it will be an interface. And exactly the same goes about classes. Here we are not writing class auth but auth module. And here inside current user we are writing here export interface and here we have our current user interface. Now the question is what we will get inside, and it is easy to answer that, we just need to look inside our postman. So here we are getting back for our current user, email, username, id and token. So we can simply write here that we get id string, then we have our token, which is string, we have our username, it is also string, and the last one is our email. And with this we successfully defined our current user entity on our client. And now in every single place where we are talking about current user, we can use this interface. Our next step here is to create a class, because actually before we will start with creating components for registering and logging in, we must create a service which will communicate with our API. And this service for sure belongs inside our auth module. This is why here I will create new folder services, and I want to create here auth.service.ts. And actually it is really a nice naming if you don't know how to name your service. If you just want to pack some methods inside your service inside module and you don't really know what these methods are about, you can simply name this service like a module. In our case we have here auth module and auth service, but if your auth service at some point will be too big, you can always split it maybe in login service, register service, current user service, whatever you prefer. For now our service is completely fine. And here I want to export new class auth service. Now it is super important to not forget to write on the top injectable, because if you won't write this single liner it will be super difficult to debug a problem. Your imports will work, but you will get some magic errors in the console. This is why never forget injectable if we are talking about services. Now we must register this service inside our module, and this is exactly is going in the direction of dependency injections and modules inside Angular. So what we want to do here, we want to create new field which is called providers, and here it is an array and we are writing inside our, our service. So this is exactly the correct way to register all services inside our module. Now we want to create our first method here, and it will be getting of the current user. This is why here we can simply write that we want to create get current user function, and it will return for us observable of current user. 
And at this point you might have questions if you don't know Angular that deep and if you don't know what are observables at all and this thing with generic here might be confusing for you. So what is observable? This is just a representation of the stream. So what is stream? This is something which is changed over time, which actually means we can subscribe to the stream and when the change is happening in the stream, then we will get new value. And inside Angular everything is working only with streams, we are not using promises there. Which actually means streams and observables is a specific pattern how we will write our code. So what we are saying here that we are getting back an observable and here we are providing what data type we are getting back. And in our case we are saying here that this function must return an observable of type current user interface. And current user interface is exactly our current user object. Now inside we want to fetch some data and for this inside Angular we have HTTP. This is why here I will write constructor and inside private HTTP equals HTTP client. So what this line is doing at all? This notation with constructor then private some variable equals some class is how we are injecting some dependencies inside a service. And it is totally fine if it is a little bit scary for you to see such code, we will write exactly the same code again and again in every single video. For now you just need to understand that we must use HTTP here inside our service. This is why here we must inject this HTTP client. And now here in all our methods we can use this.http. And in our case here we want to use get method to get our user. So what I want to do now, I want to create a URL. And actually here we can just paste HTTP localhost 4001 slash API slash user and we simply throw here our URL. And now we need to return this HTTP get URL. But here we are getting an error. Object type observable is not assignable to type observable current user interface. Why it is happening? Because actually HTTP get is returning by default observable of object because our HTTP get can't really know what data we are getting back. We know it only ourselves in our application. What we can do here we must specify what we are getting back. And in this case here we are saying ok this specific HTTP get by this URL will return for us current user interface and not just some random object. This is why in this case we are not getting any error because this single line is returning for us observable of current user interface. And you just must remember that all this HTTP will return for us always observable of something. Now the next thing which is really bad is this line. Why is that? First of all here we directly wrote base URL. This is super bad approach. Why is that? Because this line will break on production, it is suitable only for development and we need to write exactly the same code again and again in every single method. This is bad. For this we have environment variables inside Angular. We can jump back inside source, environments and here environment TS. And this is exactly where we must define all our constants based on specific environment. So what we must do here, we can create new property API URL and we can just paste our string here. So localhost 4001 slash API. And this is totally fine because here in our development environment we are setting API URL. We also have here environment for production and we can define different API URL there. This is the most correct way to do it. Now we can just use here environment and as you can see we are getting auto import dot API URL plus and here we simply need to use slash user and nothing more. In this case we are reusing this environment URL and it is completely isolated inside environment variable. Our service is fully ready but what we want to do, we want to get this user every single time when we load our Angular application. Why is that? Because actually we are storing our current user normally in memory and after logging in or registration we simply store a token inside local storage. This is why every single time when we are jumping inside our application we need to get current user. For this I want to jump back inside our app component and this is exactly the component which will be loaded on any page. And here we can write implements on init. And if you don't know what is on init, this is a special method which will be called on initializing of our component. 
and here I am writing in Jiren in it, and inside we can use our service. But in order to use it, we must inject it here. And here we are writing exactly the same stuff like we wrote inside our service. Private, not HTTP like we did in the service, but auth service that we just created. And here we must import our auth service, which is inside our auth module. And now we can use it here directly inside ngeon init, so this auth service, and we have here get current user method. But what is most importantly, this returns for us an observable. And typically we want to do something to listen to the changes of the observable. This is why here we will write dot subscribe, and now inside subscribe here we will get some information. So here I will just write res and console log res, so we can check if it's working. I will jump to the browser and reload the page. And just to remind you, your client web server must also be started. And here we are getting an error, HTTP client, all service, no provider for HTTP client. What does it mean? It means that we used the HTTP client in our application, but we didn't inject a module of HTTP client inside our application. This is why to fix it we must jump inside our app module, and here we must import HTTP client module. In this case our error will be fixed, let's reload the page, as you can see now it is working. But here we are now getting an error about cross origin request. And actually this is totally correct, because we didn't configure properly our express backend application to work with cross origin requests. This is why we can simply jump back inside our server and here open source server TS. Our next step will be to install additional package. This is why I will jump inside our server and write here npm install course. And course is the most popular package to solve course problem with express application. I will just jump back inside our server TS and here I can write on the top import course from course. And now the only thing that we must do here is before our body parser for example, we can write app use and we are providing inside course as a function. As you can see we don't have any errors now inside backend and we can reload our frontend page. And as you can see now we don't have this course error and we are just getting unauthorized. Let's check what we have inside network. We have this request for user, and if I will make it a little bit smaller, we can see what we are getting inside response headers, and we are getting here access control allow origin star. And actually this is why it is working. Our backend set it correctly this allow access origin, this is why we are not getting an error from the browser. But as you can see here we are getting for 0 01 unauthorized, and actually this is completely normal. We are not logged in in our application, we simply fetched current user and we got an error. This is totally fine. What is not fine we didn't react in any way for this authorized request. So what we can do, we can jump back inside our app component where we wrote this code and we can also handle an error. And for this we can write inside subscribe, not a function but an object. And here inside object we can have two fields, first of all next, this is exactly our success. And as you can see here I am leaving this function as it is. But after next we can create an error, and in this case this is what will happen if we have an error. So here we can simply write console log error, and maybe we want to see this error. Let's check what we are getting, I am reloading the page and we are getting our error, HTTP error response. And here we have unauthorized, and we can react on this error. So what I want to do now, I want to create set current user function. And actually it doesn't make a lot of sense because we are not logged in, but we still need to save information inside our application that user is not logged in. In this case the whole application, every single component, can check are we logged in, no, and then our component knows how to react to this. This is why we must jump back inside our, our service, and here I want to create new method set current user. And here inside we are getting current user, which is our current user interface. And it will return void, because actually we will just change data inside and not return anything. And actually it is not completely correct, here is current user interface or null if we don't have a current user. Because actually if we are not logged in, we want to set current user to null. 
Now the question is what we are getting inside. Typically what you will see in lots of applications, people simply define a local property inside owls like user and then here you can simply write this user equals user. And this is not a best approach with Angular. And inside Angular it is super comfortable and efficient to work with streams because it is much easier to react on streams and combine them. This is why we must use more difficult approach, but it is more suitable for bigger applications and it is correct. This is why here I want to write that we are getting here current user stream. And here I want to create new behavior subject. And inside behavior subject I am saying that we are getting here current user interface or null or undefined. And after this round brackets and here we are saying undefined by default. So what I wrote here at all and how we will use it. Actually what is behavior subject? This is just a representation of streams. This is just a stream which has a default value. In this case our default value is undefined. And we can also set inside the stream such types as current user interface, null or undefined. And now inside set current user we can change the stream. We can write here this dot current user and to change the stream we are using dot next and we are providing new value. In this case here we are providing current user and it is completely valid because current user interface is a valid type. The main point is here that a lot of components inside our application can subscribe to this current user stream and they will be automatically re-rendered at this moment here when we are changing the value inside current user stream. And don't worry if you are not getting it completely, you will see how we are using it in later lectures. So we successfully created our set current user and now here inside our app component, at least inside error, we can do something. We can set our current user to null. And here I will write this dot our service dot set current user and here inside I will write null. So what is happening here on initialize of our application, we are getting here current user. If we didn't get current user, then we are setting it to null. And now you want for sure to ask me why I wrote here null, undefined and current user. It makes some sense to set here current user and null, but not undefined additionally. And they did it with the purpose, because actually we must handle three different states. First of all, by default we have undefined, which actually means for us we didn't fetch current user yet. It is not ready. If we are setting here null, it means that we fetched current user, but it was unsuccessful, we are not logged in. So null here means we are not logged in, and current user interface obviously means that we are logged in. So we successfully created our auth module, our service, current user interface and some basic functions which we will need in next lectures. In previous video we prepared lots of stuff regarding current user. In this video I want to focus on creating our register page because the API for registration we already implemented. And for this we first of all must create a new component. This is why here I am inside app auth and here we must create a new folder which is called components. And the first component that we can implement is registering. And here is one important word. Actually later we will implement two components, registration and logining. But the differences between these two components are not that significant. We have in registration additional field username and in logining we don't have this field. And then we have different API URL, this is it. All other stuff is staying the same. This is why we have two possibilities. We could create a single component and just manage it between login and registration or we can create two different components. I prefer to create two different components just because it is easier to maintain later even when we duplicate code a little bit. So here let's create a new folder and call it register. Now inside this folder we must create ts file and html file. And here we will have register.component.ts and also register.component.html. Now inside our component we must export our new class register component. And inside this component we must first of all provide a selector. And here you have an important decision. You can name all your selectors starting with the name of your application. For example you make some prefix which is valid inside your application. For example in our case we can name it Ltrello 
or just L, and then you have a difference between all libraries that you use and components from our project. Because actually, if we are jumping inside HTML, and here we have L, register, then we know that this is component of our project. If you have here, for example, prefix MT and then a button, you understand, okay, this is a material library, and it is not our project. This is the first approach which is possible. I prefer another approach where I prefix every single component inside module, which actually means now we're inside auth module. This is why here the selector will be auth dash register. It is much easier because we won't use libraries, and in this case we can see from what module we are getting this component. The next thing that we must provide inside our component is our template URL. And this is the URL for our register component HTML. Now we should not forget to register our component inside our auth module. So here we are jumping inside auth module TS and we create here a field declarations. And inside we can now write register component and auto import it from components register register. So our component is there, now we can write some markup for our component inside our register component TS. And actually here I missed letter S in the word register. Now let's write a markup for our register page. And the first class that we have here is Steve with class login page. And it might be confusing for you, but this is just because our styles were written for login page and it is exactly the same like register page. So here we have our div login page, and now inside we will have a link on the top. So here we have a router link, and here is slash. So this route is going to our home page. Now inside our router link we want an image. So here will be image source slash assets slash Trello logo dot svg, and after this class Trello main logo. And at this moment you want for sure to say, okay, we don't have any images. This is why I especially for you prepared all these images and put them inside this folder inside assets. And you can take all these images from the archive of this specific lesson in the description box below. As you can see here inside source, inside assets, I have quite a lot of images. So don't forget to take them for our project. Now let's jump back inside our app, auth components, register, register HTML. And after our a tag here on the top, we want to create div with class form container. And it will be our container for our form. Now inside div form container, we want to first of all write div class login header. And again, we have the class from the login, but it is not a big deal. And here we're writing register to Trello. After this div, we will write a class for errors of validations. And actually for now we won't put any errors inside it, but we will use it later. This is why here just div class errors, we are closing it and it is completely empty and nothing is rendered there yet. Now after this we have our form, so let's open and close the form tag. And inside form we have specific fields. So first of all here we have an email. So input type email and here we want placeholder email. And the last one will be class login input. Now I want to copy paste this line two times because we need not only email, but we also need here our username. So here we don't need type, placeholder will be username and class will be login input. And after this type password and placeholder password. After this we can create our button to register user. So here will be button type submit class login submit button. And inside this button let's write word register. After our form we want to render our links. So here we will have div class bottom form links. Let's close this div and inside just create a single link to our sign in page. So here will be a router link again. Here we will have slash login page and class register link. And here inside our a tag we will simply render sign in. Let's check if anything is rendered. 
Actually, we want to jump to slash register page and see our page, but it doesn't work because we didn't register our route register. For this, we must jump back inside our module, auth module, and here we must register all routes which we want to create inside this specific module. This is why here on the top, we can create routes array and we can say that this is routes. And in this case, it won't be just array, we will have inside the validation of every route. So here we need to add one object with our path, which will be register, and our component, which we just created, and it is register component. In this case, it will work after we will add these routes to our imports. This is why here we must write imports and use here route module dot for child. And it is important to use here for child and not for root, because we want to create these routes inside our child module, not inside app module. This is why here for child routes, and these are routes for this specific module. Now let's check this out. I will reload the page and jump to slash register. And as you can see, in this case, it was rendered. We can see our form without any CSS, and here is our SVG file that we provided on the top. So now your question is for sure, where is our CSS? And this is the point. I also prepared the whole CSS for our project, so we will be fully focused only on Angular and writing business logic. This is why you must take the source code of our project under the video and there inside source folder, inside style CSS, you must copy these lines. And as you can see here, these are all imports of new folder, styles, which you also must copy. So you need to copy two things, source styles folder and source styles as CSS, you must override this file. So inside our source styles, we have lots of different styles. As you can see here, for example, create task, we have everything regarding creating task. And all these styles are global. And we will use all these styles just to be fully focused on the Angular application. Also, I want to remind you that our global file source styles CSS is automatically used by Angular, which means if you wrote this import here, it will work out of the box. And now if we will reload the page, we have here our markup. So we have here a Trello icon, and this is actually a link to the home page, and we have our register form with email, username, and password. The only problem is here hello El Trello that we can see in the corner. This is just some leftovers inside our source app, app component HTML. And here we can remove this line and just leave here router outlet. So here we successfully created our markup for register page. Now we want to bind somehow this form together with Angular. And actually inside Angular we have reactive forms. And this is an additional Angular module to work with forms in the RixJS way. This is why let's jump back inside our auth components register, register component TS. And here first of all I want to put inside our form new attribute form group. And here I will write equals form. And here also we need ng submit for submitting of the form. And here we will create on submit. Now the question is what is this form group? And actually inside reactive forms, we can create a form group inside a component and it will be a representation of our HTML form. And it will be fully binded to our HTML elements and it will work out of the box. So what we want to do here inside our class, we want to create our form. And this is actually this.fb.group. And we don't have fb inside our component at all. This is why we must inside constructor inject it. So here I will write private fb and this is form builder. And as you can see, it was imported from Angular forms. Now here on the top, we have access to this fb group and here is our form. So what fields do we have? First of all, we have an email, and actually here we can say as an array our validators. So initial value here is empty, and here we can write validators dot required. In this case, reactive forms will check by default this field for emptiness. Now we can copy paste this line because we have exactly the same. We have here our username, also empty field and validation required. And here is our password. It is also empty field by default and it is required. 
So our form is successful already, and this line here, form form group form, is binding this specific form to our HTML. But it is not all, we also must bind every single field. And here everywhere we have this input. And actually what I want to do here, I want to put a form control name attribute. And here we will bind specific field for every input. So the first one here will be our email, the second one is our username, and the last one is password. In this case, when we're changing these inputs, they will be updated inside our form group here. And the last thing that we must create is our onSubmit method. So we already created it inside our HTML. So here we can simply add onSubmit and it returns void. And now inside I want just console log onSubmit, comma, this form dot values. Let's check if it's working. I will reload the page and we're getting an error. Cannot bind to form group since it is not known element of the form. Why it is happening? Because we didn't inject reactive forms module inside our module. So let's jump back inside our auth module and here inside the imports we must write reactive forms module. And after this import we should not get this error. Let's reload the page. As you can see we don't have any errors. Now I can provide something inside and just hit register. And as you can see here inside console we are getting on submit email username and password, which actually means all our fields were successfully binded to our Angular component. In previous video we created marker for our register page and also the form but we are still missing our API call, which we must implement in this video. This is why first of all I want to jump back inside our auth services, our service, because actually here we will write all our API calls. And we have already here get current user, which we will polish later, but for now I want to create register API call. This is why here we can simply write register, and the question is what we are getting here. We are getting actually our form, but we didn't type it yet at all, this is why it is not comfortable to use. And we don't want to write here that we are getting any, because it doesn't make a lot of sense. What this method wants, it wants to know what we are providing inside. This is why I want to jump back inside our types and create here a new type. And we can name this type register request interface. And you might ask, okay, but why such strange naming? And actually it is not strange. The main idea is that I'm post-fixing everything that we're writing regarding requests and response with specific postfix. In this case here I know, okay, this is a register request, so this is the body of our request. If we're talking about response of our register, if we need it, then it would be register response interface TS. In this case, it is easier to understand what you are using this interface for. Now let's create this interface. So here I want to export our new interface and it will be register request interface. And what we will have inside? Exactly all our fields that we wrote inside our form. So here we will have our email, it is string. Our username, it will be also string. And the last one is our password. And our password is also string. And actually it is not only about the form, if we will look inside our server, source, controllers, users, we already created here a register method. And inside our register method, this is what we are looking for inside body. So request body email, username, password. And this is exactly what we are sending from the client. So our register request is there, we can jump back inside our services, our service TS. And here inside register, what we are getting as a parameter, it is our register request. And our type is register request interface that we just created. Now the question is what we are getting back. After registration we are getting back our current user. This is why here we can write exactly like in get current user, observable of current user interface, we already have it. In this case everything inside our method is correctly typed. Now we need to create a URL property. So here URL and we're using again environment.apiurl because it is the same slash users because our register request is just a post for slash users. 
and here now I want to return this HTTP and we have access here to HTTP post and inside we are providing first of all URL and secondly body and our body is our register request. But again we are getting here an error, because our type is observable of the object and not observable of current user interface, because obviously by default HTTP POST doesn't know what we want to provide inside. This is why inside our HTTP POST we must provide what we are getting back and it is current user interface. But it is not all, we also must create an additional method to set a token inside local storage. What does it mean? Actually when we are registering a user or getting a user, we are getting also a token field that we prepared on the backend. And we should not do anything with this field on the client, but we must just save it inside local storage and attach to every single request. In this case our backend can understand when the request is authorized and that we provided the correct token. This is why here I want to add an additional method set token. And actually inside we will provide a current user, because either we will call this method after getting a current user, or after registration or logging So here current user is current user interface, and now it will return void, because inside we simply want to use local storage. And here I will write local storage dot set item, and inside I want to provide field token, and we are writing inside current user dot token. So this method simply stores inside local storage our token of current user. And now we are fully ready to adjust our component. So let's jump back inside our components register component and here we have on submit. And obviously this form value is wrong here, we want to use our service. This is why here I want to inject our service, so we are writing again private and we have auth service, which is our auth service class. And here now inside on submit we can write this out service dot register. And as you can see we are providing inside a register request. But inside our component we just have this dot form dot value. And actually this form value, as you can see here the type of it is any. This is why it will work for us and we can't really type it in any way. So what register returns for us, it is an observable. This is why here we can again write subscribe with object inside in two fields, which will be next if it is correct or it will be an error. So inside next we will get current user back and here we will do some logic and if we will have an error here, then we must specify an error field and here is a function with error and inside we can simply console log an error. So first of all here I want to write error error and here inside next console log, our current user, comma current user. Now let's check if it's working. I will provide some email which does not exist inside, username and password, and hit register. And as you can see here is our network, we are getting here two requests. First of all we are getting options request, and it is completely normal because we used course, and we have a request between two different hosts, because we are hosting our applications on different ports. So you will see these options every single time, it is completely normal. But we are interested in our post request, which is slash API slash users post, and here is our payload. The payload is completely correct, and here is our response. As you can see we are getting back our email ID, token and username. Which actually means everything is working fine, and here we are getting our current user. But as you can see before we are getting error HTTP error response and it should not bother you because this is the error of this unauthorized request and we will fix it in the later video. It doesn't do anything to our register component. So as you can see here in the console we are getting our current user which means our code here is completely correct. So what we can do now, we can write this dot and here we have our service and we can call here a method set token and provide inside current user. Then this line because we have here current user will save our token of current user to local storage. But it is not all, we also want to save a user for the whole application and we already prepared before for this a method dot set current user. And inside we can simply provide our current user and this is this method, it will just set this current user in current user stream. And you will see how we are using current user stream in the later videos. 
Most importantly that now, after registration, we set it a token and we set it a current user inside our application. And the last thing that we want to implement is our validation, because actually if we will get an error, we want to show it. This is why here, first of all, I want to type our error, because we know what is it. It is an HTTP error response. And here we are getting our error, and we can write here dot error at least. And yes, this dot error will be any, but still it is better than nothing. What we want to do now, we want to save our error here. Now the question is, in what format we will get our errors? And for this I can open again our controllers, users, and as you can see here is our catch. And what we are doing in this line, we are mapping through our errors and we are getting messages as an array of strings, which actually means we are sure that if we are getting an error, it is always an array of strings. This is why what we can do in our client inside register component, we can generate an error message and show it here. This is why what I want to do here, I want to create just a single error and it will be of type string or null and by default it will be null because we don't have any error. Now here inside our error we can write this dot error and we know that here we are getting our error inside as an array. This is why here we can simply write error dot error dot join and here will be comma space, which actually means we want to join all our errors with comma and space and it will be just a single field. Now I want to jump inside our register component HTML and here where we have div class errors, I want to write in if and show this field only when we have an error and inside I can simply render our error. Now let's check if it's working. But as you can see here, we are getting an error cannot bind to ngif, it is a not known property of div. And it is happening when we didn't inject a common module inside out module. This is why here inside imports, we must import common module from Angular. Now as you can see, we are not getting any errors and what I want to do, I want to provide invalid data. For example, inside email, I will provide data not in correct format. Now let's clean everything and hit register. And as you can see here, we are getting our error and this is an array with invalid email and we are rendering this invalid email here on the top which actually means we correctly reacted on error and on success of registering of our user. Now let's check if we really saved token after registration. This is why let's reload the page and provide correct email, username, password and hit here register. As you can see we got our user which actually means we stored it in memory. But here when I'm jumping inside application, local storage you can see our token and here is a value. Which actually means we successfully implemented registration of the user and we stored the token inside local storage. In previous video we successfully finished our register page. In this video we must implement login page and I think this is an awesome idea that you try to implement it on your own. So what do we need to implement on this page? Actually login page is simply URL slash login and we see they're exactly the same form like register but login form. So actually we have just an email and password and we don't have username. Obviously all tags are different, but essentially this is it. Also we will use the another request for loginning on slash API slash users slash login. And here I have three levels of complexity for you. First of all you can pause this video right now and try to implement it yourself. Second level is you are getting some guidance from me before you start to implement. So what do we need to do at all? First of all, as you can see here inside auth components, we have a register component. And as I said earlier, we don't want to share a component between registration and login, which actually means we can implement the new component login with exactly the same markup, but without our username. And our TS file will be super similar, we need a form, we need on submit and so on. But the main difference there will be in a service. We won't use our service.register, but we must create a method login, which actually means we must in our service here create login request, which will make an API call. And actually it will be super similar to our register, but here we must create not register request interface, but login request interface. And then inside we must provide a correct URL. If you want to try it yourself now, just pause a video here. And if you don't want to try it on your own, let's do it together. 
And our first step will be to create the interface for our service. So here we have our register request interface. And actually, as you can see, we have three fields here. So we can't reuse it inside Loginin. What I want to do here, I want to create a new interface, login request interface. Let's jump inside this file and we can copy paste completely our register request interface. Just because it will be super similar and they don't want to type a lot. So here we must create our interface, login request interface, and we have inside email and password and we don't have our username. So we successfully created our interface. Now we can jump back inside our service and we can copy paste register method fully because our login method will be super similar. Let's name our method login and here we don't get register request but our login request. And here we need another interface that we just created. It is login request interface. And back we are getting our user which means it is correct observable current user interface. Now here is URL. We have here API URL slash users slash login. And this API we already implemented inside our backend. And our login is for sure a post request, which means here we must provide a post with body login request that we set as a parameter. And our login in service is fully implemented. Our next step will be to create a component here. And actually, as I already said, register component is super similar to our login component. It doesn't make any sense to retype everything on your own. This is why I want to copy the whole folder and paste it here and rename to folder login. Now we have login component, we must rename here pages. So it will be login.component.html and here login.component.ts. Now we must jump inside our HTML and change it a little bit. And it won't be that different. First of all here, instead of register to Trello, we can write login to Trello. Now we are leaving here errors, just like we had them there. We also need form submit and here we have email, username we don't need at all, we can remove it and we have our password. And now here is submit button, not with register, but with sign in, for example. And last but not least is router link here on the bottom. It should go to registration page. This is why here is slash register. And instead of this text, we can write inside sign up for an account. So we successfully changed our HTML. Now let's jump to our TypeScript file. First of all, we must change our selector. It is not auth register, but auth login and template is login component HTML. Now class name also is different. It is login component. We leave error as it is. And here is our form. We need email and password, but not a username. So let's just remove username here. Our constructor stays the same, our on submit stays almost the same. But here we won't use register method, we created login method, where inside we are providing the whole form. And here we have subscribe, and if we are successfully logged in, then here we console login current user, we are setting token, and we are setting current user. Which actually means it is 99% exactly the same code, like inside registration. And our last step here will be to register our component. So we must jump inside auth module TS and here inside declarations we must say that we have a new component and it is login component. And we also must create here a new route. So I will copy paste the register route and add here path login and component will be login component. Let's check if it's working. We don't have any errors here inside web server. I will reload the page and try to jump here on the bottom, for example, in sign in page. And as you can see, we are on slash login and here is our form and we can reload page. We are staying on this page. Everything is fine. Now let's try if we can log in at all. So here, first of all, I want to write something incorrect. So here is some email which does not exist and then some password. I'm hitting here sign in and we're getting an error. As you can see here before, we are getting photo to error with validations. And inside our error, we are getting field email or password, incorrect email or password. And we are doing this in this case because we don't want to notify a user what exactly is not correct. We should not say something like this email is already taken. We simply say it is invalid. 
This is why this logic inside login component won't work. And just to remind you, here we copy pasted our on submit, and here inside an error we joined our errors. Because in the case on register page we had here an array of strings. Here we don't have it, we directly see an error, email or password. Which actually means here instead of the join, we can write error dot email or password. In this case we will write correctly error inside. Let's check this out. I'm reloading the page. Let's type here some email, which does not exist, some password. Sign in and we're getting incorrect email or password, which means our validation is working correctly. Now let's try to log in with correct credentials. So here I have foo at gmail.com and here is our password 123. I'm hitting here sign in and we're getting current user. But the main problem is we're staying on this page and secondly we didn't remove this error at all. And actually we can do both things simultaneously. First of all what I want to do here on submit, we can remove this error. So here this dollar error we can write inside now. And actually I can say now that error name is not the best one. Because actually error is super generic. And I would like to change this name in here from error to error message for example. In this case we need to change it here inside next and here inside error. And after this we must jump to the template and change it there also. So here we have ng if error, it should be error message, and here we are rendering our error. And I think that this approach is much cleaner, because it gives us understanding what we are rendering here. It is not some generic error, this is really an error message. Now we must apply exactly the same inside our register. So let's jump back inside our register, and here first of all I want to write error message, here is also error message, and inside ts file I want to change error to error message, and here write error message inside error, and we want to set it in null in our success, so here this error message equals null. And the last thing that we want to do, we want to redirect a user to another page. It doesn't make any sense that we are staying in this page, at least we want to jump to the home page after logging in a user. In order to do that, we must inject here our router. This is why inside constructor I can write private router equals router. And as you can see this router is coming from Angular router. And now here inside success, on the last line, we can write this dot router dot navigate by URL. And we are providing here URL, for example, just slash. And now we must do exactly the same inside our login page. So I'm jumping inside login component, and here first of all I want to inject private router router. And after this I can paste this line, this router navigate by URL slash which actually means in both cases with registration and login in, we want to redirect our user to the home page. Let's check if it's working. I'm here on login page, I'm writing here foo at gmail.com, here 123, I'm hitting sign in and I'm jumping to the home page. Which actually means we successfully implemented our login page. And this was the end of the first chapter. If you want to dive deeper in creating full stack application, make sure to check the link in the description box below.